Hello, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us today for our traceability in the cocoa sector section, uh, uh, in the, the cocoa sector session. Um, very excited to be joined today by our uh, speakers who are uh, to begin with uh, from Hershey's, Angela Tejeda Chavez. Uh, she's head of sustainable sourcing uh, there at Hershey's. We also have uh, Olivier Svolsman, uh, responsible sourcing manager for Coco at Ferrero. And then from Mars, we have Ricardo Romero Perez Grovas, who is Global Coco Sustainability ML Manager there. And uh, myself, uh, I'm Amoy Kwaku, uh, Customer Success Manager for our Coco Vertical here at SourceMap. So welcome again, and thank you so much for spending this time with us. Um, to begin very broadly um, and really uh, uh, let our uh, very knowledgeable panelists guide the question. I want to start with a broader question that we had around what your organization um, traceability goals are and some of the challenges and successes that you found there. And let's start with Angela. Thank you so much, Amon. And hi, everyone. Very nice to be here with you today. And thank you to Ricardo and Oliver for joining me today as well. Um, I will start by saying very simply that traceability is the beginning and it's, it's not the end of our work in sustainability. And I will say that why do we need traceability is very simple, it's for a couple of reasons. The first one is to understand and to manage the risk and the opportunities in our supply chain. Without knowing where the products originate, we cannot really understand what are we entering into. And the second part of this as, as CPG companies and as public companies, which is the case for Hershey, we need to have credible evidence that our claims in regards to deforestation free can be backed with traceability. So in that sense, that's how we look at traceability is our way to conduct due diligence in our supply chain, but at the same time is to provide credible evidence for claims that we make either in the deforestation free space or any other claim that pertains to our how we source and where we source. That is very good. And I do want to maybe um, uh, ask this question with maybe a twist around some of the challenges, especially regarding um, data collection, the, the many mandates, <laughs> that, the many mandates that uh, uh, your companies are, are responsible for from various organizations and how um, uh, Olivier, how your, your team has been facing some of those challenges. Yeah, I think, uh, so uh, welcome to everyone. Uh, and, you know, from uh, Ferreo's side, uh, I think we've had, of course, a previous session with Nicola Semenzi. So uh, what is the importance of supply chain visibility within the Ferreo responsible sourcing strategic approach? And also building on what Angela said, I mean, uh, indeed, traceability is not an end in itself. It's it's a means to an end, and a, but a very critical enabler when you want to um, ensure uh, due diligence. Uh, I think uh, an important thing when it comes to traceability also to highlight is that you need to have some stability in your supply chain uh, because um, you need to establish, you know, uh, in our case, long-term relationship with farmer groups. Um, now, not only to, first of all, I mean, in terms of traceability, um, you know, that you get to know those farm groups, uh, not just the farm, but also the, the farms that are part of this, um, because you can, you know, map the farmers in your supply chain, but if, uh, you know, the next season, that farm group is no longer your supply chain, then you have to do everything again. So this, uh, so building long-term relations with farm groups is a critical factor that I think when we talk about their traceability uh, has to be addressed. Uh, because everything starts with continuity. And that sometimes when you talk about challenges, one challenge is, is that it can conf conflict with uh, procurement objectives uh, because it means that the more you have a, um, uh, say, a uh, supply chain with whom you have long-term relationships, uh, the less, uh, say, uh, uh, space you have in terms of maneuver, in terms of procurement, because you, you you want to buy from the same farm groups and from the suppliers that are linked to those. So I think that's a maybe challenge to 
to highlight as well. Uh, but again, traceability starts with establishing long-term relationships. Um, but this is a challenge because we see when it comes to uh, COCOA, an annual turnover of members within pharma groups of roughly, say, 10%, uh, so that farmers, uh, they come and join uh, farm groups. Um, and so that means that every, at the start of every season, you have to assess how many of those farmers that are in your supply chain that year are still there and how many new farmers have joined that need to be uh, mapped. Um, so that is something I think it's not something when you have mapped your supply chain, you're done. It's a continuous process um, that needs to be done. Uh, and then also with existing farmers, even if they're still in your supply chain, uh, you have to uh, say go back every so many years to check if their uh, say farm situation is still the same. Maybe they have expanded uh, the you know the number of uh, cocoa plots that they uh, say produce. So that's also something that uh, you call like a shelf life of, of particle mapping. Uh, but say every three to five years, you definitely have to go back to your existing farmers. Um, uh, so I think uh, this is one of the, the challenges. And also, I think and I will probably come back later also with the, the other uh, uh, peers here on, on the call. But uh, it's not just uh, you know uh, sending people out in the field to map a farm or to uh, do registration. It's also the data validation work that is sometimes overlooked, how much goes into that, that you make sure that the data, the protocol mapping is actually really done in the correct way, shape files and everything. Um, and I mean, there are many more challenges to highlight, but I think I leave the floor to uh, Ricardo to, to, to build further on this. That is a very good um, uh, point and a very good segue also into Ricardo, uh, because I do want to ask Ricardo, uh, we've heard a little bit from Angela about the goals being around managing risk, um, uh, creating credible evidence for claims. Um, we've heard from uh, Olivier a bit about uh, the need to have stability and, and uh, in the face of turnover. Um, and of course, data validation, uh, continuity. And so from you, can we hear maybe a little more about the successes before maybe jumping back into challenges um, some more? Well, uh, thanks. It's a pleasure to be here with my colleagues, Angela uh, and Olivier. Uh, of course, uh, we're here to talk about uh, not such a controversial issue, such as traceability and transparency it would be more controversial to be talking about like uh, which chocolate product will test, taste better, uh, but if we're talking about something simple as just traceability. Um, I think uh, for us, well, we have committed to, to have polygon maps for all our supply chain by 2025, for everything where we source from. So that's the public commitment we have and we're working towards it. But as Olivier said, it's not something that it's finished, that your supply chain has like people coming in, coming out all the time. So every year you have to revisit these things even though you're advancing we have done like more than 200,000 polygons by now but you still have to to keep advancing on the percentage of polygons that you have to do on the supply chain but also going back to new groups because um, you have new farmer groups or within the groups you have farmers that, that lapse like as Olivier has uh, described it uh, and we're always thinking about like polygon mapping as a risk assessment tool or as a risk mitigation tool, but also we can dream about it, right? Like having the polygons knowing where the cocoa is there. Well, of course you have to do risk assessments about deforestation and land use change, but what about land, land management and the possibilities that that can give us? Like if we start investing a lot more in agroforestry, if we start investing in, in systems that could give us the possibility of improve uh, the land management. I, I think that can give us a room for not just risk mitigation, it can give us a room for, for steering the supply chain and to dream, right? To start improving like this uh, landscape level. And the polygons will give us that possibility of really starting thinking about uh, uh, these chances. That is a really interesting um, idea around, um, you know, Coco has been really, um, I, I dare use the term saddled, uh, with a lot of requirements, rightly so, uh, but with a lot of requirements to, to contend to, uh, but then to put that in terms of dreaming to go beyond the compliance towards um, uh, uh, an ideal state goal is definitely um, uh, an interesting 
perspective to have while doing this important work. And so I do want to, to touch back, um, to dip back into the, the challenges a bit. Um, uh, Olivier, you mentioned turnover. Ricardo, you uh, highlighted that uh, again. Um, and from one of our previous sessions, uh, Rafael uh, from Sutton was talking of also about turnover as a challenge that your teams face uh, in the work that, that, you, that you do. And so I, I wonder if you have any, any more that you want to, to talk uh, about around this idea of maintaining uh, the uh, level of, of visibility vis-a-vis uh, -vis the turnover in the face of all of the mandates that you have uh, legally and otherwise. Um, I'm happy to, to continue on this. So farmer turnover and farmer group turnover is definitely one of the challenges that needs to be managed. Um, and it's possible to manage, but it is an ongoing challenge. And, and I like to think about it as, as continuous improvement. So we are very good at thinking about continuous improvement goals when we, when we talk about factory improvements. We are not very good about thinking about continuous improvement when it comes to sustainability. And I think the challenge there is that it has taken, despite the investments that cocoa has made, the cocoa industry has made, and the hundreds of millions of dollars that we have invested in origin to make this happen, we have only started to draft the protocols as to what counts and what doesn't count in the past couple of years. And that's a big learning that I will take to anyone that is working on this is from the onset, when you say traceability, what do you mean? And, and a lot of the challenges in sustainability have been that sustainability tends to be complex and to get people along and to get my investors along and to get my leadership team along, I cannot give them a complex story. But to make this happen, I need to deal with that complexity. And I think that's the challenge that we face as sustainability practitioners, which is how do we bear and continue to manage this complexity? To your point, it just keeps adding every single year. It does not reduce over time. And how do we keep the confidence from our investment and senior leaders to continue providing that funding? And that balance between showing the complexity of what the work is, but showing that there is light at the end of the tunnel is very critical. And the other challenge that I would like to mention, which is, it's, it's a challenge, particularly for companies that have more than one factory, which is the case for the three companies that you have here. We have more than one factory. We process our products in more than one factory, more than one country. The challenge that we face is, is that it's not only about getting the sustainable supply chain, and it's not only about being able to, to, to buy it at a good value, but it's also about the reliability aspect of it. We need to keep the factories running. And that's what we tend to forget sometimes from a traceability point of view, that there are things that we can do, but if we don't keep those factories running, it's going to be a challenge to keep the investments in the long term. And I see Ricardo has his hand up, so I'm going to mute myself now. <laughs> no, it was a little bit of this idea that, of course, there's a technical issue. There's also like a policy issue, like in different origins, different policies and different policy frameworks. Then in consuming countries, there's also requirements. And there's all this pressure for the companies to comply with all these things, right? And it becomes quite a complex thing using a, a term that, I don't know if you're familiar with Slavo Šišek, but he, he used a term called empty signifier and we can end up in an empty signifier. We really don't define what traceability is really concrete. Uh, then we can just keep talking about sustainability, traceability without any technical definition. Then we can keep talking about the words, but do not mean much. So we really need those technical frameworks uh, that are compliant, of course, within the origins and within the consuming countries. But we need to be specific about what we talk, because if not, we're just using the same words, but meaning completely different things, and we can end up with an empty signifier. That sustainability is quite, quite common one, right? Like when you ask what sustainability means to different companies, you end up even sometimes with mutual exclusive approaches, right? So the detail, the detail is, is very important. The technical complexity of really defining these things, it, it's super important. And now we'll end up talking the same words, but meaning completely different things. That is a really good point. And Olivia, I do want you to, to jump in on this to, to talk more about um, uh, these challenges and around defining traceability, because indeed it is a widely used term that um, we use a lot without necessarily specifying what we mean. 
No, I mean, of course, definitions are, are key. And I think all the companies that are here uh, are also part of uh, collective initiatives. Um, and I think it's important to, to uh, highlight, I mean, uh, that in those uh, so like platforms that we are part of the World Cock Foundation, uh, in this case, um, these are the discussions we're continuously having when we are discussing about collective reporting frameworks, uh, like, for example, on the collective initiative, uh, the Coke and Force uh, initiative. I mean, this is a, a continuously ongoing process where we define, uh, review together with uh, you know, definitions um, and, uh, and indicators and uh, trying to avoid uh, that uh, people are reporting on, on certain uh, indicators in different ways because they have uh, interpreted in different ways. So that in the end you, you're comparing apples to pears. Uh, it's a very difficult um, uh, exercise uh, to do uh, because uh, it, there's so much granularity that comes to it. But I think what we're seeing at the same time, uh, and I think this is also important when it comes to uh, say uh, the maturity process on traceability, is that um, I think in the chocolate sector uh, it's quite unique how uh, companies are uh, say um, collaborating. Uh, together through these collective platforms like the World Cocoa Foundation and what we're doing, for example, through CFI. Um, and um, what we have done this year under the umbrella of CFI is that we launched a pilot where companies were sharing farm polygons uh, with uh, the World Resource Institute, um, and um, which then reviewed those polygons. And uh, they had in the beginning hoped that a uh, you know, handful of companies were joining, in the end, 20 companies were joining which first of all demonstrates the willingness of companies to, to work in a more collective coordinated way. But the other thing also is that WRI then applied one definition or the, one approach to uh, reviewing uh, say uh, shape files and so farm polygon data. And then on top of that, once they, they completed the review, they performed a uh, deforestation risk assessment uh, with a methodology that they developed on all of those polygons. Uh, I mean, this is, I think, a very strong uh, signal of, you know, the commitment from the industry and the willingness to share data, but also uh, one of the ways how we can uh, go to more like um, the same way of, uh, you know, uh, reporting and using the same definitions. Uh, but this is a continuous process because, uh, as I said, we, uh, and this is another challenge, we see so many different reporting frameworks uh, today, whether it's through uh, World Cork Foundation and DFI, but also with the ISCOs in Europe or uh, other reporting frameworks that uh, say uh, we have to report on. Um, so harmonization of reporting frameworks is, is really a, a key topic. And then of course, it's more than just traceability itself, but it's, it's all about uh, definitions uh, and, and indicators uh, and, and, and really understanding the same language. Uh, and that is a really, um interesting uh, uh, development though from all of the work that the companies have had to do for decades now individually to now moving towards doing um, collective work and it's so positive. Uh, Ricardo, please uh, jump in and, and, and join in on, on this. No, I think uh, that's a really important point from Olivier. Uh, the amount of time we are translating the same data point into different reporting frameworks, is, it's quite heavy. Uh, of course, uh, different legal frameworks require different things, but at the end of the day, it's exactly the same data point that you just have to, to approach in a different way or uh, really modify a little bit. And all of those are resources, right? Uh, so when it becomes more expensive to do the reporting, the, the activities in itself, it loses a little bit of, of, of uh, why are we investing so much in, in this? I understand it. There's a really high transaction cost. Like institutional frameworks are, are quite low in some of the origins. I understand why, but at the same time, it's resources that we're losing, right? Uh, we're investing heavily in a lot of things instead of promoting activities that could actually change the root causes of deforestation, the root causes of, uh, of all the challenges that we're facing. Because we're facing cocoa small scale farmers, in difficult economic situations most of the times in most of the origins. So these are the, the root causes of, of, of the problem. So traceability, polygons, yes, but also we need activities on the ground that transform that reality. And if we ended up investing more on how to control these things than in the activities themselves, I think for me, it's a waste of opportunity and a waste of resources. I'm not saying that we don't have to do it. I'm just saying we can do it in a better way as Olivier was describing. 
Indeed, because how do you, and I'm, I don't want to appear biased here, but just, you know, really the challenge of how do you make sure that you're able to come up and breathe for air to really think about how do you create impact when you're also so busy just collecting data for the sake of collecting and reporting. Uh, Olivier, please go ahead and, and, and add in uh, your, your, your opinions there. Yeah, I mean, this discussion about, uh, you know, how can we uh, all uh, be more effective in, in what we're doing and, uh, you know, in that sense also, uh, you know, uh, be more cost effective, in particular, because we know, uh, I mean, it's not like in, for example, if you take a country like Ivory Coast, which is the main cocoa produ producing country, that there's a particular area which is uh, where only Mars sources or a particular area only Hershey sources or where, you know, for real. Now, we all source, uh, you know, in the same areas. Um, and we know that uh, we have farmers, you know, that are in the supply chain, which can also be in Mars supply chain or in, in the Hershey supply chain. So we are investing in farm mapping as part of our commitments, but we know at the same time that we have a, a lot of what we call duplication of, of farm mapping, uh, which means that, uh, you know, uh, we pay more than once the price of farm mapping, which can be done more cost effectively. That's why, as I mentioned earlier, this collective farm data set that we launched under the CFI is an important step uh, in, in how we can, do, uh, you know, uh, clean this and do this more effectively. Uh, because, of course, what, one of the outcomes of the review by WRI was that there was uh, indeed a percentage of duplication, which was quite considerable. But this is also, I think, from why in, from industry side, we are a strong supporter of national traceability systems, uh, which are, uh, you know, um, uh, developed by uh, the origin countries and where we as industry can uh, contribute uh, in making sure it's robust and reliable and, and, uh, and you know, contained with the, uh, the data for, on farmers. And, and why a national traceability system? Because in the national traceability, traceability system, all farmers um, in the country will be registered in one system under one unique number, like a social security number. And that uh, normally in a system like that, only the farmers that are registered in the system can sell their cocoa. But also if you have one system, uh, and in that system, it's already, uh, uh, for example, uh, marked if a farmer has been mapped or farmer, then you know if that farmer is in your supply chain, you don't have to map it again. Um, and I think that's why we as, a, as industry are support, uh, supportive of this. And there was the, uh, an event last week in Italy where also industry showed its commit, commitment to share that kind of data with the origin countries. Um, and again, I think this for the chocolate sector shows the maturity of where we are today. And of course, we still have a long way to go. But the fact that companies already have a lot of this kind of data and are willing to share it with each other in a pre-competitive way, but also with um, you know origin countries and other key stakeholders, uh, shows um, you know a, a direction in which we want to go uh, all together. Go ahead, Angela, to to add on to what uh, Olivier was. Uh, talking about around moving towards uh, um, national uh, systems. Yeah, and I also want to link back to something that Ricardo also mentioned, because there is indeed, an, and one of the big challenges, as you can hear from all of us, is inefficiencies. And inefficiencies that can be the blocker for other opportunities that we can give back to farmers and the communities. So that's inefficiencies, and that's the collective, collective actions that can help us. And, and the comment that I wanted to really stress here as well is that and something that we had learned as well as industry and as a company is that we are not here to replace national systems. Our role as a private company is to accelerate. We are just an accelerator of whatever infrastructure already exists in place and we can catalyze change. That's our role as private companies. We are not the government and, these, and, and we have to recognize that and we have to be willing to share that. And by doing that, and that's my hope as well, is that by doing that, we may be able to give back some of this data back to the farmers and the communities, because right now it's, going, it's, it's more of a one directional relationship and the return is in the form of a premium or in the form of buying cocoa or in the form of being in a program. But we are not, in my perspective, and from what I have seen is really, we can do more. We can really do more and, Perhaps, and that's my personal dream, that by giving back more of the data and the farmers, they can also be more, it can give them a little bit more of negotiation power and decide ultimately who do they want to sell to, um, as long as it's very, very clear 
in the rules or in the guidelines, let me put it that way, not necessarily rules, but as long as it's clear in the relationship that they have with the, your buyers. But it's, it's true, like it's definitely this collection, collective actions, national traceability system, we have to recognize their importance and our catalyzer role. Uh, go ahead, uh, Ricardo. Yeah, just to complement, uh, a part of like really helping this process and we have capacity, we have certain polygons that are already in our systems and the data, it's also that role of the private companies to check a balances, right? Like, like we, we will have that role also uh, if the national systems need a counterbalance around like data quality and, and, and procedures and guidelines, we could be like uh, one of the stakeholders uh, that fulfill that role, right? Uh, I think that would be important. Uh, and I'm just putting it on, on the table. I, I, that's not something that, that I have a, like a, a, a clear idea about it, but I think that that part of the role it should be important uh, in origin countries. And thank you so much for, for these additions. So to, to maybe summarize a little bit some of the, the key learnings that we've had thus far into the conversation, talking about the, the challenges and, and successes that we have, that your, your organizations have had uh, in the work that you do. Um, beginning with some of the, the challenges, you know, there's been a stability um, in the supply chain, um, ensuring continuity uh, and continuous improvement. Um, data validation in addition to the collection, the, pro the processing, the analysis that we haven't really talked about as much, but maybe as a, a source map person, I could just like put a little comma and, and add that. And um, also defining traceability, which is a key point uh, in what are we doing? What does traceability really mean so that we're all uh, talking about the same thing? And then it's uh, inefficient. So really finding efficiency has also been a challenge. And then um, to summarize, and of course these summaries are not um, uh, are not um, exhaustive, but to summarize some of the successes, we've had um, the collective work that your companies and others in the industry have engaged in, um, uh, the movement towards national traceability systems, which can really help to reduce duplication uh, and uh, some ongoing processes of um, defining traceability continually evolving the definition and alignment across the industry on traceability um, that is happening throughout the industry. Now I want to switch gears a little bit and talk about these challenges and uh, Olivier, um, I'm going to let you maybe jump in and, and complete what, what I was saying before we, we uh, switch gears. No, I think, I mean, we, we talked a lot about the challenges, you know, that we, we face with, with traceability. Uh, but I think, you know, as we said at the very beginning, it's also a critical enabler, um, you know, in order to, to perform due diligence and in help improve our supply chain. I think to highlight this point as well, you know, the importance of, of traceability to, uh, you know, our, our strategy. Um, it's key because, of course, you know, when you have your uh, visibility on your entire supply chain, you can then act on it. Um, and this is also where additional information becomes relevant. So not just the data that we have ourselves on, on whether the farms in our supply chain or the communities and where they are, but uh, data that we can overlay on that information. So uh, whether it's uh, you know through satellite monitoring on where deforestation uh, has taken place or uh, has a higher risk of taking place, um, but also on uh, when it comes to um, more on, uh, for example, topics like child labor and, and all of the companies here are also longtime members of uh, the International Coke Initiative, ICI, uh, which is, you know, uh, core uh, mission is to to tackle the issue of, of, of child labor. And, uh, you know, where there we have also uh, a lot of tools that have been developed by ICI, especially in the past years, to assess, to like to classify risk levels to communities or mm -hmm. households. And, uh, why I'm saying is that from a strategic view, uh, viewpoint, when you overlay your supply chain with this kind of information, you can start applying a more risk-based approach. Uh, so not doing the same everywhere, but uh, uh, having a, a say more uh, say high intensity of activities and in, uh, investments in areas where there's a higher risk, either on the environmental side or on the social side. And I think you know we're doing this individually as companies, 
but again also here in this area of uh, you know trying to improve the supply chain and addresses is where we have acknowledged the importance of uh, you know collective coordinated action um, and uh, we are all uh, as i mentioned a part of ICI where we are launching now landscape projects in both Ivory Coast and Ghana uh, to really uh, uh, improve also really the supply chain uh, in an integrated uh, collective way so i just want to highlight this point of about the importance for the strategy uh, and not just on um, you know ensuring compliance alone um, no that's that's a really good um, uh, highlight there and and really appreciate that um i do before we jump on to the next uh, sec section of uh, the 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 this session I just wanted to, to thank you all again for being here and really want to thank Angela who joined us uh, despite having um, a competing uh, uh, conflict. Uh, and so we're going to let Angela go now, but thank you so much for uh, making the, the time and joining us for, for a moment. Thank you so much. See you soon. See you. All right, so um, thank you again for highlighting uh, the need, really, because I think that you've all touched on how critical traceability is and the, the, uh, the, the, the tool that it is also for your organizations. And so I think that in summarizing the last piece, um, it, the last part of the conversation, it is important uh, to, to highlight that. And I just wanted to switch gears a little bit and, and uh, talk about, um, you know, the, we've talked recently about uh, uh, data, but you also are having all of these mandates for a data collection and data analysis um, for uh, in, that are increasing uh, over over time. Um, at a, a same at the same time that we are also getting. Um, more recognition of the need to protect uh, uh, individual privacy and individual data. And so how do your organizations um, balance or maybe not balance, but what, what are some challenges that you're encountering um, around that, around reconciliating those two? Well, first of all, you should have let us, I didn't know that Angela was going to leave and I kept interrupting her. Now I feel really guilty. Uh, we should have let her talk a lot more in the first part uh, of the session. Uh, well, again, you have to respect all the data privacy and data management like frameworks in each of the countries that you operate. And it has a lot of different safeguards. Uh, and that creates, of course, a kind of a conflict, but you have to respect those regulations, a conflict of efficiency, because you cannot do everything that you would like to do unless you respect those uh, um, uh, characteristics of the data privacy or data management. So sometimes it's really difficult to disaggregate the thing and then try to put it together within the, um, within the characteristics they're requiring. Uh, but I wanted to touch what uh, Olivier was mentioning a little bit earlier uh, about data validation, right? Because you can have all these data points uh, from surveys and it can include also sensitive data that you have to respect the, the legal framework. Uh, but all or a lot of these uh, data points are coming from small scale farmers um, with surveys, with interviews, like, yeah, you take the polygon, of course, and traceability, but you also make a farmer profile and you ask all these questions. Uh, so we need also like enough visibility and granularity on all this data in order to really validate it. Like sometimes we are receiving these vast amounts of data that we assume is really precise, but when you go down to the field and you really supervise those data collection exercises, you, it's really difficult to conciliate both things. So I don't think we should resign to this idea that we have to have boots on the ground, really supervising the quality of the data and the data campaign exercises as brands. And I know we are removed, uh, ourselves were removed from the direct supply chain. We, we do it with tier one, tier two uh, supply chain. So we're a little bit removed, but we don't resign about that, like that possibility of having the visibility of the supply chain with boots on the ground and tips on the ground that are really checking on how this data makes sense at field level. Because if not, 
uh, you can have the most beautiful dashboards, you can have the most beautiful analysis, but if what you're impu like if you're putting inside the system doesn't have that quality, then it doesn't make sense. Like that you have the most beautiful dashboards on the world, the data doesn't make sense, and and that's the end of it. So you need that quality control and that boots on the ground. And for us, is that something that we that we actively do and that we're really proud of it and that we will keep doing and enhancing. No, that's that's really interesting. So essentially, in in addition to the collection that um, you are having to do to the analysis, um, really needing to have um, relevant validation in place, uh, relevant and robust validations in place to make the best sense of the data, but also supervising the data collection and the processing at origin to make sure that you are ending up with good quality uh, uh, data as well. That that is um that that is noted. And um, Olivier, did you want to drive um, that point further, or have um, uh, any additional uh, notes that you wanted to 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 highlight there? No, I really can only uh, say. Uh... I need to reiterate what Ricardo says, the data quality is, is such an essential element uh, uh, that actually the numbers that you receive or that you report on that you know that it's it's really uh, reliable. And uh, the deeper you go into the data, uh, the more you'll find and um, and that there's, you know, it's never like a black or white, it's always something in between and uh, with a lot of like comments and explanations, why this, why that. Um, and I mean that's again also why it's important that uh, you have a long-term uh, relationship with with your you know direct suppliers tier one, but also with the farm groups, so that you can you know tackle this better. Um, also because a lot of the interventions we do in the supply chain have a long-term focus, whether it's a conversion to agroforestry uh, systems or other interventions. But just to highlight also another point, and I think. In terms of, uh, because it was mentioned before, uh, data uh, uh, privacy policies or data sharing policies. I mean, sometimes the challenges that we face is that uh, is also expectations, uh, expectations uh, from um, which can be NGOs, which can be uh, um, uh, government, say, consuming countries, so the governments, about uh, say the level of detail you have on your supply chain. Uh, for example, one example is uh, uh, visibility on the household income of your farmers and how this evolves. I mean, this is very private, personal data. I mean, if I always try to put myself in, in those shoes, do I want somebody else to know, uh, you know, what my household income situation is um, and where, you know, what sources of revenue uh, I have? Um, of course, from our side, we don't, uh, we want to use that data for the better to help, uh, you know, the farmers and, and their families in our supply chain. But at the same time, it is very private information. Uh, but we are expected sometimes by the the outside world to have that kind of uh, you know visibility in our supply chain and uh, to a very uh, deep level of detail. Um, and that that's a uh, you know finding always the right balance there, uh, but managing expectations as well. Go ahead, Ricardo. Yeah, that's a great point about uh, income. Uh, that is a hot topic. Everybody wants us to measure assets or uh different income indicators and first of all if we want really to have this indicator in a really big sample our only way of doing it is with surveys and that's really not a good way of collecting this type of data or we can design like really specific uh studies that measure it also invading some sort of privacy there's a power imbalance and there's all these complications so I think we have to make a really good effort to explain what all these requirements that are asking us, how do they translate into data campaigns in the cocoa sector with the small scale farmers in the countries we work with? Because somebody in a university imagines this perfect study, like it would be nice if we could have all these variables. But when we do the data campaign, like, they dilute so much or the tools we have or the sampling we have dilute so much that it stops making sense. So I think we have we have a better relationship there on what is being asked, how is being asked, and really the limitations of how, what we can control these things because this income through surveys, it, it really doesn't make any sense. That's not giving us any visibility on it. 
uh, it has to be designed in a different way. That that is really interesting. So here you have raised um, just uh, uh, summarizing down to two main points around one the types of questions that we're asking uh, anyway uh, in the context of the privacy uh, protection uh, uh, laws and regulations. Um, and then two, the way in which that sensitive data is collected. So, so noted here for our small summary of this, sec of this session. Um, I want to ask now uh, an audience question. Um, so um, uh, one of our uh, audience members has asked across a lot of industries, customers are starting to prioritize purchasing products uh, that they perceive as responsibly sourced, responsibly sourced in quotes. Um, how has that impacted the priorities, if at all, uh, at your respective organizations? Uh, perhaps we can start there with Olivier. I mean, uh, when it comes to, uh, you know, again here, terminology, uh, what exactly do we mean with certain wording? And I mean, if, this session, I think, makes it clear that it's, you know, it's uh, quite a complex, you know, uh, topic, uh, you know, uh, supply chains and traceability, uh, which you don't have to explain, you know, consumers in, 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 in a few words, like, you know, put something on the packaging, uh, which is, you know, uh, quite difficult. Um, I mean, what we are trying to do here, as we explained, is, uh, you know, having, first of all, visibility in our supply chain and then uh, assessing our supply chain if there are, you know, any non-compliances, which we then uh, will address either on the social side or on the environmental side. But this is a continuous process. So when it comes to, like, responsibly sourced, as I said, that's not like, okay, uh, uh, it's done, like, one day. It is continuously you know, working your supply chain with your, uh, you know, suppliers from uh, tier one the, all the way down to uh, to the farmers, and um, and assessing, uh, you know, uh, the situation in supply chain and addressing it. But also because the turnover we said earlier, you know, the farmers, uh, you know, they come and they go, um, and so you need to map them again. You need to, you know, uh, support those farmers again, and this is a continuous process. Um, so I would say. Uh, to sustainability, you, one of the key things is that you have to at least make sure you have systems in place in your supply chain um, that are monitoring on whether it's deforestation or on child labor or other uh, key topics, uh, because those systems are, say, the basis, uh, and they need to be reliable, reliable, and they need to be able to identify any non-compliances on which you can then act and, and report on that. Uh, but it's 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 a uh, it's a continuous process. Uh, I think we, this is something that needs to be highlighted. But I think that if I look at uh, our sector, I do see a very strong commitment from companies uh, to really make their supply chains uh, say more responsible um, and and really uh, in that sense also uh, walking the talk. Um, but is uh, and I think also what I mentioned earlier the. The fact that companies are also willing to collaborate together uh, and managing uh, the supply chain or, or as a sector, as a, so the whole supply chain, not just their own, demonstrates, I think, also um, uh, the direction uh, we're going and the commitment from these companies. That is a really good point. And I think that in, in what you were saying there, you added um, uh, a point there that, um, uh, Angela had mentioned also before around the difficulty of reducing down uh, all of the work that you're doing, the very complex work that you're doing uh, into the simple sort of messaging that uh, must come across uh, to the uh, uh, consuming side. And so, um, uh, Ricardo, did you want to perhaps take uh, a stab at the, the question? Well, I was thinking more around the power of the narratives, right? Uh, and the cocoa sector has been put under a lot of pressure and under this, uh, let's say, dark uh, light in recurrent articles, uh, media. Uh, it's the power of a good narrative. Like cocoa has everything to have a, a source of good, right? Like 
the perennial adapts well to agroforestry systems, uh, really well done, could even like sink quite large amounts of carbon. Uh, it, it can be a driver of um, living income. It can be a driver of environmental biodiversity preservation. So I think cocoa has all these elements to be a, a source of of good as a perennial, like adapting really well with really good shelf life. Um, I, I think that that power of of transforming cocoa from this uh, problematic sector always on, on the headlines for the wrong reasons, I think has all the right elements to be on the headlines for for the good reasons, right? Like to really improving like livelihoods of the small scale farmers, giving them new opportunities, that making these communities uh, economically viable, dynamic, uh, giving more opportunities for not just cocoa farming, for new positions on field trainers, field coaches, uh, improving these uh, traceability systems that could be done within the community and, and, and development projects within the community. So I, I think the power of that narrative on, on, on a positive light, it, it's something that that can be done and, and that we're doing, we're moving our pieces as a sector to, to put it into that light. I'm not saying it's easy, that we face massive challenges, really complex situations. Uh, in different origins, there's different complexities, but all the right elements are there. And with a really well coordinated sector, I think the cocoa uh, can be like a vibrant source of, of great stories and it can be in the headlines for the right reasons. Thank you so much for that um, optimistic note on how to, to move forward, um, Ricardo. There is a question, an audience question um, that I see there that, that you want to answer, but perhaps we can uh, let Olivier jump into uh, this thread before uh, switching gears. Well, I think there was one question which came in and uh, Ricardo, uh, I don't know if you want to take, I can take it, it wasn't you know, what we mean by polygon uh, mapping. Um, I mean, Basically, what we usually say is that uh, when you have, uh, say, a minimum is to have one GPS waypoint for a farm. Uh, but uh, that's what uh, is, say, the min minimum. Uh, but when we say polygon mapping, it means that somebody has physically walked around a cocoa farm, uh, taking several GPS coordinates, which then becomes, as they call it, a shape file. Uh, which uh, uh, is what is then uploaded onto the source map platform. So they just really the, the whole size of the, the farm. And then usually when this, uh, uh, say what we call polygon mapping exercise is done, other data is also collected on the cocoa farm. So it's not just the GPS coordinates around the farm, but also, for example, how many trees are on that farm, the age of the trees um, and uh, uh, other types of trees maybe. So a lot of different, uh, uh, say, uh, data um, elements are collected on that farm, but that's what we mean with the polygon. So it's really uh, the whole size of the farm with different GPS coordinates, then making one uh, shape file. Uh, I don't know, Ricardo, if, if because it's a, sometimes a technical thing. If if I left out anything when we say polygon, no, but uh, maybe the how a simple thing can become complicated very quickly because depending on who you're reporting with, that it's just a plot or a farm, right? Because for a farm, for WCF, it has to be all the cocoa plots of that farmer have to have a polygon. So what you're describing maybe in one reporting area, it's a farm, a polygon farm, uh, but in other reporting uh, framework is just a plot. So it becomes something as simple as that, like a shape file that reflects like the boundaries of, of a field, of a cocoa field, can be interpreted as a farm or can be interpreted as a plot, depending on who you're reporting with. So those are the level of complexities and, and th that we face when we're reporting and managing the data, because one little tweak then transform the whole thing from one plot or maybe four or five polygons become a farm, right? So it, it is it is not as nothing is as easy as it seems if you go into the details. I can, that is such uh, a important point. Go ahead, Olivier. No, I can echo that. And actually, uh, I mean, to add complexity to this, and this is again why the data cleaning is such an important element, um, is that, uh, I mean, if somebody walks around a farm, there's an adjacent farm, but maybe somebody walked not just 
really directly on the farm of one farmer, but also a little bit on the, somebody else's farm. And then if you have those two different, uh, say, farms in one uh, system, then you have an overlap. Uh, so what is then still, uh, and then this is the, when we talk about definitions, like uh, the threshold, as we call it, that you apply um, that is allowed of overlapping with other farms. Like if it's more than X percent, you don't, you disregard the save file. So the mapping, protocol mapping has to be done again. Uh, I think this is, illustrates again, the complexity of what it uh, you know comes to, because maybe some, uh, one company says, well, if, even if there's overlap, I, uh, you know, the shape file is a shape file, uh, while another applies a threshold for, for overlap uh, that needs to be respected. And even a threshold can differ. One say, okay, 10% maximum, the others can say 30%. Um, so, but uh, <laughs> the question was, what is polygon mapping? Uh, it means really, you know, uh, multiple uh, GPS coordinates on, on the farm uh, plot. Um, instead of just one GPS waypoint. Um. Those are, are really important points though, because um, in this work, so many terms that are used and that can have one or two sentence um, definitions actually have a lot of subtlety around them and around how they're used. Uh, how the work is done and so on and so forth. So thank you so much, uh, Ricardo and Olivier for really highlighting that. I think that that is important um, to highlight the level of difficulty um, involved uh, in traceability uh, as a whole, um, as, as, as a short example talking about polygon. And, and so with that, I, I really do want to perhaps move towards how we conclude uh, this session um, and, really thinking about what you both are excited for, for the future of the cocoa sector. Ricardo, you had given us a bit um, of a taste of the, the ways in which you're looking forward positively. So I, I wonder if you can maybe start with that. And Olivier, of course, had, had some points as well. So um, uh, Ricardo, can you start us off on what you're most excited uh, for the future of cocoa? Yeah, well, as I mentioned, I think this uh, living income topic is is becoming quite like an an, an engine, uh, so that small scale farmers have the opportunity to have a, a, a living income that, and not just the minimum threshold, like enough for having like a vibrant life, and communities have this possibility of of education, of good services, so that cocoa really can be an engine for development. I, I, I think this topic, it's, it's hot. Uh, in Mars, we're investing heavily in this uh, sustainable cocoa pilot that look at how to increase uh, income to reach living income, different living income benchmarks, and, and not just the minimum, like really to have a vibrant uh, cocoa farming sector uh, in the different origins. So, I think uh, it seems difficult to imagine, but all the elements are there. All the challenges of the world are there also. But I think as a sector, we, we could really start building into the idea that like a cocoa farmer can be, and a cocoa community uh, or a community that, that has a lot of cocoa farmers can be a vibrant place that with full of opportunities for the new generation. and not the last resource or, or, or a poverty trap or the way it has been described for a lot of, of uh, in a lot of uh, places. So we're investing heavily on understanding these, like how our investments can be leveraged. Um, and I think the results of these uh, sustainable cocoa pilots for the future will, will guide how we are gonna invest in, in the small scale um, farming. Uh, of course, Mars cannot do it by itself. Uh, the, most of these challenges are so big that we, not just even the industry, like we have to come together as an industry, but also as an articulated third sector with uh, the different actors and stakeholders, uh, including the government, NGOs, and, and, and of course the, the industry together in a coordinated way. Uh, but the possibilities are there and, and the dreams are there and a viable um, cocoa farming community in West Africa, like that it's vibrant, it, the possibility and the dream is there and and I think we we can work together uh, to achieve this goal. 
Thank you so much for that. And, and I think that it also addresses one of the questions I saw in the chat around what um, uh, your organization specifically, Ricardo, is doing um, to end some of the issues that we see uh, on, the, on the ground. Um, uh, Olivier, uh, would you like to perhaps take this question too around uh, what you are most excited for uh, for the future of COCO? Yeah, if, if, if I look at uh, COCO, I think uh, really having two things that uh, for me stand out, uh, the collective data sets, uh, you know, as, as industry, you know, as I said the, the collective farm data set, but also on the, within ICI, we're discussing about collective community data sets as well. Um, so having all of those uh, the data into one uh, data set that on which we can then build. Um, I mean, this is what something I'm really excited about and I really see uh, a strong willingness to move in this direction, but of course, building further on that, uh, the national traceability systems, you know, working that not just as as industry uh, between companies, but really collaboration with the, the origin governments and also with the consuming countries, uh, because it should be really a tripartite uh, activity there. Um, because of course, uh, we are doing all of these, um, you know, uh, efforts on our supply chain also to meet re a requirement set by consuming countries. For example, the EU do this legislation uh, to meet those requirements as a company, uh, and whether it's in the US, the same thing, um, uh, to meet also requirements set by, by the US. But I think a second point, which I'm really, um, I think has to be highlighted as well, is that uh, accessibility of this data to uh, uh, the farmers. Uh, which, of course, in the end, are the, the you know the, the very starting point of of the supply chain, and, and to what extent they can benefit from this all of this data that is being collected, and um, you know, and you know, we're using it to support the farmers. But if the farmers can have access to the data themselves, uh, it can op maybe open up opportunities for them as well, and, and of course, individual farmers, but also to the farm groups they are a member of. So I think that is also something that I think is our responsibility to look at how we can provide you know, um, the very key stakeholders in our supply chains uh, to have access to this kind of uh, data as well. That is, um, that is such an important point. Um, and uh, Ricardo, I, I see that you wanted to, to weigh in perhaps. Perhaps well, it's some finishing uh, thoughts. Yeah. No, I'm aware of, of the time and, and it's, it's almost uh, gone, but I think a recurring topic during these discussions, even when Angela was around, it was about gaining efficiencies in order to invest where where impact can happen, right? So, so I, I think that possibility also it, it's uh, important if we gain all these efficiencies in reporting and in information systems, then maybe we can leverage those resources uh, somewhere else where where interventions and impact and programs uh, can can really help us lifting. Uh, creating this uh, vibrant uh, cocoa farming community. So, so I think this, this opportunity to gain inefficiencies, not just for the sake of gaining inefficiencies, is also like give us opportunities uh, to, to improve the type of interventions where we're gonna, we can, we can have. Thank you so much for, for adding to this and, and uh, really driving the point around uh, efficiency. I really do want to thank you for joining us today to discuss this really important topic and i want to thank also our audience members uh thank you again and uh, we shall uh, be around uh like you uh, in the audience enjoying the rest of the session goodbye